Good evening. So I'm really interested in how planets form and evolve, partly because we want to understand our place in the solar system, but we also want to understand our place in the cosmic garden. There are over a thousand known exoplanets, planets around other stars. The best planetary system that we can study is the one that we live in. And so I'm interested in studying how Mars and Venus and Earth and the small bodies in the solar system can tell us about how our solar system formed so we can apply it elsewhere. So when you think of Mars, you probably think of it as the red planet, the fourth planet from the sun. You also probably think of that, right? You probably think of us having this robotic geologist on the surface of Mars. Curiosity is incredible. It's this NASA mission. It really is a robotic geologist. This spacecraft can drive on the surface and study it. That's one way to study Mars. But I think the other thing to remember is that there's been a flotilla of spacecraft that have been orbiting Mars for many, many years. And so what I'm interested in is looking at the climate and changes with my collaborators about how we can understand Mars, because if we can understand how it's different from Earth, then we start understanding better why we're in the habitable planet and Mars at some point was warm and wet, but no longer is. And so why is it that our conditions are okay for us to sustain life and sustain water on the surface in liquid form, but Mars didn't. And we have evidence from Curiosity that the, and other uh, spacecraft that there was at some point standing water on Mars, but there is no longer any liquid there. The atmosphere's thinned, it's cold. And so this is a picture of the South Pole of Mars. It's very different from our polar caps. So the South Pole of Mars and the North Pole of Mars have, have water ice and basically CO2, so carbon dioxide ice. That's a very alien thing compared to Earth. And so because Mars is such a thin atmosphere, mainly it's carbon dioxide, in the winter when this cap is growing, 30% of the Martian atmosphere condenses out into this ice sheet. And if you remember, you know, Mars is the red planet. There's all this red dust that's in the atmosphere that condenses out into this ice sheet. And so that ice sheet and it's how it thaws over time, it tells us something about the atmosphere. So if we can probe that, we can probe the climate. So what I'm you know, interested in and, and been stu studying with my collaborators is this weird process that occurs on the South Pole of Mars. So if you, this is an image taken l last year from this, the, the South Pole, and you might notice there's these dark streaks and spots, splotches on the surface. And those are real. Those are, those are actually caused by, we think, carbon dioxide geysers going off on the South Pole. So again, what, this is not what happens on Earth. Because you have a slab of carbon dioxide ice that's semi-translucent, it does have the dust in it, but the sunlight can basically penetrate mostly through and hits the regolith that this ice sheet's sitting on top of. And the ice sheet's only about a meter thick. So you have this meter thick slab, and then you have the regolith being heated, and so it heats the surface layer below, and the ice in contact sublimates. So now you have a trapped layer of gas sitting underneath an ice sheet and it breaks out in any way it can back into the atmosphere. And so you get a pretty dramatic set of geysers that are going off on the surface. I wouldn't want to be standing there in the summer, spring and summer. So the dark streaks we think are the dust and dirt coming up with the, the carbon dioxide gas out to the surface. And then we think blown by the local wind. So we've never been able to catch sort of these geysers going off and seeing the, the the material bend over. So the shadow measurements as well as trying to catch this, we think it means that it's the winds, the local winds at the surface that are blowing this material. And when you don't see these fans and you see more of the blotches sort of more towards the bottom, it's really sort of the vent, you, the, the material coming up and falling back down at the vent. So it looks something like this would be what we think we'd see at the surface. So these things aren't very high, but again, you know, there's many of them going off at different times of the day. And as I said, this ice sheet has that dust in the Martian atmosphere in there. And so if we can understand what's going on with these geysers and how they're working and how it changes from Martian year to Martian year, we have a way of probing the atmosphere in a way we didn't before. But the other exciting thing about this 
is that it can tell us about wind direction. As I said, it's blowing those local winds. So just to show you those two examples between the side where there's wind, and if you actually kind of notice, they look a little like the, the wind direction change. You saw it go one way and then move again. And so if you would image that over time, you might catch the wind changing. But also, there's no when you get those splotches. Now, in this example, you also might know that there's a lot of them in there. This is just a subsample of a, of a larger image. If you can count all of them, if you could get their sizes, if you could get their shapes and their directions, you've got one of the largest wind maps for the surface of Mars, for area. The so where we have direct wind measurements on the surface is from the landers and the rovers. There are not that many that have made it to Mars. And so this would be a larger area of coverage. Why is this important? It's important because if we want to understand Mars's climate, we better get right that interaction between the surface and the atmosphere. And that boundary condition, this can probe, especially for the South Pole, where there, you don't typically send spacecraft. You send them to the equilateral regions where you can actually get sunlight. The South Pole goes into darkness you know, during a period of time. So we want to map these things. And the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which launched in uh, 10 years ago, uh, is the spacecraft that is giving us the best data on this, on this area. So it is equipped with high rise. It is the highest resolution camera ever sent to another world. And so it can see about a coffee table on the surface of Mars. And so this spacecraft has been orbiting for nearly a decade now, giving us five Mars years of data on this. So again, if we can understand the differences between season to season, we get the wind directions, but we also get information about other things. So in this image, I'm showing you two different Mars years on the surface in the same spot from high rise. So this is a high rise image. It's grayscale. But what you can see here is there's many, many fans and blotches in this image. Now, the difference between season one and season two is that a global dust storm occurred, pumping lots of dust into the atmosphere such that you couldn't even see down to the surface. So that material and the, what happened in the state of the atmosphere is trapped actually in the ice sheet because it was south, the, win, the South Pole was in winter. So that growing ice sheet contains a record of that dust. So if we can count those fans and their locations and their sizes and directions, we can understand how the atmosphere has bounced back from this, this dust storm and how long has it actually taken to get back to the state that was in season one. But you might already notice that in this image, there's lots of fans and blotches. This is not a task a single individual could do. And this is just a small subframe of the data. There's five years. Now it gets even trickier because, like Earth, Mars has many textures, many colors. So making an automated routine, figure out to identify all these seasonal fans and blotches and outline them is incredibly difficult. It's still a challenge, and it hasn't been done yet. But while I'm talking, my bet is that you've already identified the images that have the dark fans and blotches. And that's exactly what we can do, is that we can still try to use human beings to do this. It's our innate pattern recognition skills that we've developed over time from hunter and gathering days that we can do th use this. So we're e it's easy for us to figure out and map these. It's just a problem of one person can't do that in, in any reasonable time scale. But the beauty is, is we have the internet. And so if we can get many people to help us, this becomes a tractable problem. And it's called the wisdom of crowds. So if you can get many non-experts and you combine their assessment, they do just as well and typically better than an expert and outperform machine learning algorithms. And so this is crowdsourcing or citizen science. And the beauty of the internet is you can get to those people. And the thing to think about is, uh, the average American spends about 40 minutes per day on Facebook. If you could take a percentage of that cognitive power and apply it to this problem, you can actually do science. And so this is exactly what my collaborators and I have done. So the high-rise seasonal processes team and I and our collaborators have worked together to, to enlist the public to help us to study the Martian climate. And so using this, the, the internet, we've partnered with the Zooniverse, which is the largest collection of citizen science projects in the world. And their platform, and they're helping us, we're able to build a website to enlist people to help us study these seasonal fans and processes on Mars. And there's over 1.3 million registered Zooniverse users. So there are you know, over 50 scientific papers that are derived from Zooniverse projects. So if Mars doesn't do it for you, you can help ecologists study penguins through the Zooniverse. 
So with our collaborators at the Zooniverse and the High Rise Seasonal Processes team, we helped, we created Planet 4. And the idea here is that anybody with a web browser can go to planet4.org. There's no, any, there's no skills you need other than your eyeballs and a web browser. You already have them. So when people come to this website, they get a quick tutorial and they go straight into the data. And I just want to note, it's over 130,000 people have classified at least one image on the site. So we asked that 30 people look at the same image and we combine those results. And they've done, as you can see, over 4.7 million classifications. And so they've, the total markings we've accumulated so far are over 12 million. And so by combining these results, we're able actually to do this science. And so I just want to show you what this looks like. So again, you go to planet4.org, you see the quick tutorial, and you're off to the races. And so we have a fan tool and a blotch tool, which is basically an ellipse. And so the idea is that by your eye, if you and your markings, we can identify directions. So now we know where we think the wind is blowing, and then we can see where it's more ambiguous, and it's probably just the, the geyser material coming up and back down. And so we're asking anybody to help us with that. And so we launched in 2013, and we're very close to submitting our first paper, hopefully by the end of the year. So it really is taking clicks and going to science. So you might ask me, does this actually work? So let me show you the data. So this is, again, sort of a small subframe of a high-rise image that we show. About 30 people have seen it. And it's sort of looping through showing you the raw image and everybody's classification, and then reduced down a clustering algorithm down to the individual what we think are the individual sources and fans. And I think, as you can see, people do pretty well at identifying this. And we've compared to the science team marking it, and yes, people do really well at this. So with a very simple one-step tutorial and it going off the races, we are getting science out of this. And then you will see there are some spurious classifications. Some people might be able to draw bigger than others. But it's the fact it's the combined result of many people's assessments that get us our science. And so, you know, this project has been very successful. We're excited to be submitting our first paper. And what's led us to actually the next phase is that this has been so successful that we launched another citizen science project in June. So the thing I didn't talk about with this, this geyser process is that we also see in high resolution images from high rise, we do see these channels. Now those are actually below the ice surface. The fans are actually on the, sur on the top of the ice sheet. The, the channels are below. But what they are, they have actually been carved by that trapped carbon dioxide gas before it breaks out into those geysers. And it takes, we think it's at least on decades time scales or more, probably, probably more in hundreds of years or further, to sort of carve these channels. And so that's one indication of activity or this geyser is going off if we can see those from orbit. Now, the high resolution data looks like that. It looks very pretty. Um, but you can see them actually in lower resolution data. Now, HiRISE has been very successful in doing this monitoring campaign, but it's only looked at a few spots on the surface. You have a trade-off. You get high resolution in what you can see, but you don't get much aerial coverage. So that's a trade-off we have to live with, but there's also another camera on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that can help us. And so there's actually a camera called Context Camera. And what it does is it images a much wider area as all the other instruments are taking data. So it gives you the context for where you're looking. And it has about six meter per pixel resolution. So far blurrier than high rise, but it covers most of the pole. So if you could sift through those data and again zoom in those images, you could find those channels. And then we would know that those are new areas of, of, of activity. And we probably want to look at them. Because in this whole entire process, it matters about topography, matters about composition. And so those things matter about, you know, in, in this process. And if we can understand how that changes the frequency of geysers and the locations of fans, then we can, use, we can use that information to actually back out sort of the bulk processes that are going on and really understand the Martian climate. So in June, with the Zooniverse's new platform, we launched Planet 4 Terrains. So again, like planet4.org, anyone can go to terrains.planet4.org and help. And the difference here is we're showing you the context camera images and asking you to identify different types of surfaces that are due to the, the deposition and sublimation of carbon dioxide uh, ice or, or for the channels that are carved by this geyser process. And so the idea here is that we need to go through this data quickly. Because right now, the South Pole is in winter. 
and it's going to get into sunlight in July of 2016. So if we want new areas to point high-rise at, we want to, do, we want to know about it soon. And so with citizen science, we're able to do this. And so we launched this project in June, and these are regions like these two are areas where you can see these channels that look like they've been carved by this the trapped carbon dioxide gas. And so somebody in their home today is going to help point a NASA spacecraft orbiting another world. So the idea here is that if we think that there's geyser activity, we're going to repoint high rise. And so really it is people on this world that are helping us study the next.